Hello everyone and welcome to week five of the semester. This week's topic, courtly love and European medieval sexuality. The history of medieval sexuality is a fairly well-worn topic, and in their consideration of this, scholars have largely focused on the marginal and the transgressive, writing about prostitutes, about sodomy, and about incest, to give a few examples. More or less ignored have been those forms of sexuality deemed legitimate, for example, romantic physical relationships between men and women. This is a problematic oversight. How can one know what counts as a deviant, quote-unquote, sexuality without first understanding what counted as normal, quote-unquote? By failing to investigate the normal, we reinforce the problematic assumption that heterosexuality is normal, natural, and unquestionable. With regard to Europe's Middle Ages, one way we can contribute to the project of destabilizing the center is by examining the subject of courtly love. Courtly love was something that emerged out of the very center of medieval European society, the noble court. Around the middle of the 12th century, Europe's aristocratic elites developed a new form of social life, and a new culture that revolved around things like jousting tournaments, royal festivals, and knighting ceremonies. And along with this came a new form of literature, one filled with stories of brave knights risking life and limb to rescue damsels in distress, that is, beautiful women whom they'd fallen in love with. Out of this literature emerged the idea of courtly love, an idea that was celebrated by European nobility and that is very much still alive in Western cultures today. What is this thing called courtly love? And what can it teach us about the history of sexuality? These are the questions I'd like to peruse in this lecture. In addressing them, we're going to realize that many of our commitments to so-called self-evident truths about sexuality need to be abandoned. The most important of these is our commitment to the idea that any physically intimate relationship between a man and a woman is necessarily heterosexual. Courtly love, as we will see, did not operate under the principles that we would today call heterosexuality which suggests that this is not the natural default form of sexuality. In fact, examining the workings of courtly love shows us that heterosexuality is a relatively new concept and a relatively new way of ordering our erotic subjectivities. So, first of all, what is courtly love all about and where did it come from? In order to answer this question, we first need a bit of context, because in many ways, courtly love was a reaction to a new set of doctrines and regulations set forward in the 11th and 12th centuries by the Christian Church. It was around this time that European societies were finally beginning to recover from the collapse of the Roman Empire several centuries earlier. With towns growing, agriculture and commerce booming, and literacy on the rise, new concerns about Christian clergy surfaced. A common complaint was that religious officials were becoming too worldly, too attached to material comforts. Throughout Italy, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, parishioners criticized monks and nuns who wore luxurious robes and lived in ornate buildings. Another concern was the practice of simony, whereby church officials won appointments as bishops, abbots, and popes, not via election from the clergy, which was how things were supposed to work, but instead by giving gifts, including money, to kings and lords. In 1076, Pope Gregory VII excommunicated and deposed the German Emperor Henry IV on these grounds, and after this, a civil war ensued throughout the Holy Roman Empire. 
Out of these various forms of discontent arose a religious reform movement, one that Pope Gregory threw his weight behind. The leaders of Gregorian reform included lots of ascetics, that is, hermetic priests who encouraged Christians to turn their backs on the world and move to remote, deserted locations where they could devote their lives to prayer and self-denial. Among the various things these ascetics wished to deny were the pleasures of the flesh. Gregorian reformers agreed that sexual desire was an outgrowth of mankind's original sin, and they taught that even a single sex act could permanently corrupt the soul. Contending that lust was an unhealthy, immoral appetite that led to spiritual blindness, selfishness, and attachment to worldly things, they promoted sexual abstinence and the resistance of all sexual temptations. Out of this new sexual doctrine came a whole variety of new policies and practices. In 1136, for example, church leaders began prohibiting clergy from marrying. In addition to this, Gregorian reformers helped the church gain control over marriage. What had been a previously secular, civic institution was now something increasingly controlled by religious leaders who labeled marriage a holy sacrament that was to be registered, overseen, and adjudicated by the church. Assuming more and more control over this, the church created hundreds of ecclesiastical courts where questions around marital validity and the fulfillment of vows were settled. European nobility greeted these new sexual ideologies and regulations with hostility. Up until this point, lords, dukes, and kings had enjoyed preferential treatment from the church hierarchy, who traditionally blessed things like the annulment of marriage, remarriage, and the practice of cousin marriage. But now, all of this was to be outlawed. One of the places that felt the sting of Christian reform efforts was Acetania, a region in southern France that was a stronghold of a new monastic order called the Cistercians. Led by a reform preacher named Bernard of Clairvaux, the Cistercians wandered across the land extolling the dangers of unrestrained sexual appetite and harshly condemned all forms of sexual pleasure. As a result of their efforts, by the middle of the 12th century, all across Acetania, the practice of simony had been banned, clerical marriage had disappeared, and, as the church assumed more authority over marriage, strict monogamy was enforced. The region's aristocrats resented these new rules, and in the noble courts of Acetania, there gradually emerged a kind of protest movement, an opposition to the church's new teachings that took the form of popular song. Penned by composers known as troubadours and troubarites, these songs were a kind of counter-doctrine to Gregorian sexual ideologies. While accepting the idea that desire was a potentially sinful appetite, they put forward the idea of fin amor, that is, true love. According to the troubadours and troubarites, true love was what happened when lust was tempered, tamed, and purified by selfless devotion to the well-being of another. This genuine, other-directed care transformed the potentially dangerous energies of desire into something spiritual and holy, and as a result, desire became innocent, something God actually approved and blessed. According to the troubadours and troubarites, then, true love was what happened when partners disciplined their sexual appetites via fidelity to a single lover. Through this, sexual desire became holy, sanctified, and spiritual. The basic argument of these songs is that when a man and a woman come together in fin amor, sex is never a sin. 
So as to demonstrate this, these singers went to great lengths testifying to the suffering that resulted from resisting lust. Indeed, they argued that the pain and torment they endured while restraining themselves demonstrated the conviction of their love. It is for this reason that unrequited love was one of the major themes of Asitan's songcraft. Consider the following excerpt from the composer Gerard de Bournel, who in one song wrote, And so why do I not renounce this desire, since fortune grants me no fulfillment? Because I never saw a true lover who could give up loving. Suffering, then, is a demonstration of self-discipline, and it reveals the lover's success in subsuming their animal lusts to the virtues of other-directed love. As evidence of this, let's look at another verse of Giraud, this from a different song. You can read this excerpt on your own. These songs gave rise to a new form of love, courtly love. They placed love and desire in a productive tension and gave birth to the romantic love complex that has characterized Western sexual cultures since the 12th century. Historians argue that this is a specifically Western way of understanding the relationship between love and desire, one not seen anywhere in the world before or outside of the West. The idea, basically, is of love breaking with sexual desire while at the same time embracing it. Originating in Asitan, eventually this innovation spread to other parts of Europe and became incorporated into other kinds of writing, including romance narratives. Many of these derived in part from Arthurian legend, and in the late 12th century, one of the most popular was an Arthurian romance called Lancelot, or The Knight of the Cart. Written around 1177 by the French poet Chrétien de Troyes, the story of Lancelot was, like the songs of Asitan, an anti-Gregorian polemic. It rejects the new sexual norms promulgated by the church and sets forth a radical challenge to church doctrine. The theme of the story, basically, is true love's mastery of appetite, which is demonstrated over and over again in the plot by the story's protagonists. Lancelot, a knight at the court of King Arthur, and Guinevere, who at the beginning of the dramatic action is being held captive by an evil knight named um, Meligant. Totally dedicated to the task of rescuing Guinevere, whom he is in love with, Lancelot sets out for Meligant's castle, and throughout this story, his devotion is repeatedly tested. At one point, for example, Lancelot comes across a woman who tries to trick him into sleeping with her by instructing a bunch of her servants to pretend that they are trying to assault her sexually. After Lancelot rescues this woman, she offers him her bed. But Lancelot refuses to have sex with her, lying next to her in discomfort until she gives up. Later on, after Lancelot defeats Meligant, he is surprised when Guinevere refuses to have sex with him. Despite this upset, he accepts her refusal without question. Both of these episodes are tests, tests designed to determine whether Lancelot's love is true or false. The fact that he is able to overcome his instincts proves that his feelings for Guinevere are no mere sexual appetite. If that were the case, Lancelot would not be willing to endure the pain and suffering that the denial of his desires causes him. This, in fact, is a common theme in medieval romances. The pains of love are often seen as evidence of its purity. And in the end, Lancelot and Guinevere do in fact have sex. And the text treats this physical love as a form of spiritual ecstasy, describing it as, quote, a joy and a wonder such that nothing like it has ever been heard or known. We're going to talk more about courtly love throughout the week, but for now, I'd like to you to consider the following questions. Once you've got some answers to these, please head over to our discussion board. Until then, I'll see you later.